And so partly what you're doing by attending to your child constantly is noticing where they are in the construction of this hierarchy and they start way down here, right? And so that's why you play peekaboo, for example. It's like, they can do that. And you can, you know, you interact with them because you can watch, you do a little something and if they respond, you got some sense that you're, you're at the same level. And kids in playgrounds do that with each other right away. So if you, if you see two three-year-olds together, say they're fairly sophisticated for three-year-olds, what they'll do is they'll start playing a little primitive game with each other, like, do like a dog. You know what a dog does when it wants to play. It kind of goes like that. And, and that's what kids do, and, and that's what adults do, too. It's, it's a play, it's play invitation. It's like, I'm ready, but you're smiling. It's not like, I'm ready. It's, <laughs> and so you can tell the difference between a play fight and play, and kids can, too. So it's an invitation to play. And so if you're interacting with your little kid, they, they got that play circuit. Man, that thing's in there like when they're from birth, I think, because you can play with a kid right from birth, at least something like peekaboo. And so you're on the same wavelength, fundamentally. And then you interact with them and you see if they're following what you're doing. It's what I'm doing when I'm lecturing, more or less. I'm watching you guys and seeing if we're more or less on the, in the same shared space. You know, and we want the space to be expanding. Because if it's just staying the same, well, you might as well play whatever you play on your computer. Uh, it has to be expanding at the same time. That's optimal. And so when you're playing with your kid, you put them on that developmental edge where they're undoing and then rebuilding their little skills. You know, you can do that. Like, I had this memory from when I was a little kid a while back. And I remembered, I used to go over to these people's house with my father and my mom. And it was way up in northern Alberta. And these people were Russian immigrants, children of Russian immigrants. And they had a farmhouse way, way out in the country, way out by the way the, where the railroad actually ended. If you walked north from there, you'd walk until you hit like southern Europe without fun, running into another person. It was way the hell out in the middle of nowhere. And anyways, they had a nice house, like a warm house, you know, they had three kids and they were way older than me, but it was a real fun, comfortable place to go. And I used to sit in the living room with my father and his friend, whose name was Nick, and Nick was a really playful guy. I really liked him. He was like my surrogate grandfather. And I used to, I don't think I was more than about three. I'd sit there and I'd try to hit his foot with my fist. And he would be talking to my dad, you know. And my dad would say, Jordan, don't bother Nick. And Nick would say, well, he's not really bothering me. And because dad was checking it out to see if I was an annoying twerp or if I was a fun kid, you know, because it's a fine line. <laughs> and so I'd try to hit his foot and he would move it. And I had this memory a while back and I thought, wow. That was a good memory, and I thought, what is going on there exactly? And I realized, well, he was, sharpening, he was sharpening me up. You know, it's like I was aiming at something. You're aiming at something. You're pointing your eyes at it. You're pointing your whole damn soul at it. You're aiming at something. And you're trying to get your behaviors and your conceptions in line and organized so that you can attain that aim. That's what people do. You know, we throw rocks at things. We, we, we fire arrows at things. We shoot guns at things. We aim at things. Our whole body is that platform for aiming. And I was trying to aim at his feet, and he'd move his feet, you know? But he'd let me hit it one now and then. And so, let's say you're a rat, okay? Because, like I said, a rat's a good model for a person. Let's say you're a little rat, a juvenile male, and you want to play, because you want to play. And you'll work to play, and that's how we know you want to play if we're experimental psychologists, because you'll bush, but, button push like mad to get access to an arena where you can wrestle with another little rat. And so rats wrestle, just like human beings, and they even pin each other, just like human beings, and they love that. And so if you put little rat A in with little rat B, and little rat B is 10% bigger, little rat B can stomp the hell out of little rat A all the time. So they go out there and they have a little dominance competition, and little rat B is going to win because he's bigger, so now he's dominant rat. So then they play and they wrestle and little rat A loses. And then next time, they both know that little rat A is the inviter because he's subordinate. So he's the one that has to go up to the big rat and go, you ready? And the big rat then will wrestle. However, if you repeatedly pair them and the big rat doesn't let the little rat win, at least 30% of the time, the little rat won't invite him to play anymore. And that was Yak Panksepp who figured that out. And that is mind-boggling 
Because it tells you, like, the, there's, a, there's an ethical basis for play that's so deep that the damn rats, and they're rats, right? Not known for their sense of fair play. The big rat has to let the little rat win 30% of the time, or the little rat will not play anymore. And even rats know that. It's, it's so profound, that discovery. Like, Panks have discovered the play circuit in mammals. That's a big deal. That's like discovering a whole continent. Like, that's a big deal. He should have got a Nobel Prize for that. And to see that that's built in, that sense of fair play, that's mind-boggling, you know, because that's evidence for the biological instantiation of a complex morality. Fair play. Y even if you can win, you shouldn't all the time. Well, so when I'm trying to hit Nick's feet, with my hand, like I'm really paying attention and he's moving it pretty well, but now and then I get to nail it and I'm feeling pretty good about that. You know, and he makes it a little bit more difficult all the time so that my aim gets better and better and I'm building up my motor coordination, I'm building up my social skills because I don't hit too hard and I don't cry when I miss because that just makes you annoying to play with, right? So I'm learning really complicated things about how to go about finessing my aim and that's what you're doing with your kids. And what are they aiming at? Well. They aim higher and higher. So when my son was about two and a half, we had him start setting the table. It's, you don't say, you know, you want to take grandma's fine china and go set the table? It's like, no, you don't do that. You say, you know what a fork looks like? He goes, yeah. See, so do you know where the forks are? Well, that doesn't work because the drawer's way up here, right? So you have to hand him a fork. You say, look, take this fork and go put it on the table. And he's like, this high, you know? So he goes over to the table and he puts the fork up here. Can't even see what he's doing. He puts the fork up there and then, you know, he's reasonably happy with that. And you give him a pat and then you go and give him a really sharp, no, no, you don't do that. <laughs> you don't do that. You give him a spoon and you say, well, go put the spoon beside the fork. And you don't say, Look, you stupid kid, you gotta leave enough space between the fork and the spoon so the plate can fit there. Don't you know anything? You're stupid. It's like, well, that's right up here, right? You're a bad kid. No, that's bad. You don't do that. You go down here and you say, well, good micro routine adaptation there, chum. <laughs> Let's try it again. You know, and you build that up and like, and you can't extend the kid past its point, his point or her point of exhaustion. Because it's got to be a game, and a two-year-old can probably only do that for... You can watch them, and some are more persistent than others, but 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you're pushing your luck. You can take a two-year-old to a restaurant for about 40 minutes and expect them to sit and behave. But after that, you know, they're, they, they're, the will exhausts them. All right, well, anyways, that's Piaget in his nascent form, fundamentally. And so if you, if you remember that diagram and you think about how that would be built from the bottom up and how there would be a stage transition every time those things are learned, you kind of got the essential elements of Piagetian theory. So...